All right, in this module, we're gonna talk about imaging defects using electron microscopy as opposed to optical microscopy. So optical microscopy is somewhat limited in what it can do. Uh, because we are using light, and for the most part, visible light, the resolution of optical microscopy is limited by that wavelength of visible light. And so that, um, resolution is on the order of uh, 10 to the minus 7 meters, which is about 0.1 microns or 100 nanometers. So that's the kind of the best we can do. However, we've talked a lot about certain defects, particularly dislocations, uh, which are more on the order of 1 nanometer or less. And so if we're going to image those or have any hope to image those, then we would need something with a, a better resolution, so lower resolution, uh, lower number, but higher. Uh, that's how we refer to resolution. Um, and we can do that by lowering the wavelength. And so we need something with a lower wavelength. Um, and that's also higher frequency. So um, we can, we've talked about x-rays, right, in um, x-ray diffraction. So we're able to probe the structure with x-rays because the wavelength was similar to atoms. However, um, x-rays proved to be difficult to focus. And so if we want to image, it's all about focusing. And so x-rays are difficult. However, we can use electrons. Uh, this might not seem like a natural choice, uh, but electrons do have, if we think of them as both a particle and a wave, their wavelengths are very small, so about three picometers, and that's 0 0.003 nanometers. So you can already see the great big difference there between optical and electrons. So that means that we can get much higher magnifications than the 200. 2000 X we can get you know 1 million X and it also means that since these wavelengths are smaller than an atom that atomic resolution is possible so we're able to look at atoms or columns of atoms with electron microscopy and we get around the focusing point because electrons are charged species and therefore we can use magnetic lenses as opposed to optical lenses to focus the electron beam. So uh, we're able to focus and we have a very low wavelength. So that's why we can use electrons. So let's look at a couple different types. So the most common type of electron microscopy out there is scanning electron microscopy or SEM. So SEM gives us high magnification compared to optical microscopy. You can see down here, uh, this is actually a pretty low magnification for electron microscopy, uh, but we can get uh, even higher. In addition, um, we have what's called a large depth of field for uh, this type of imaging in SEM. And what that does is it allows a, a large depth, so heights of the material, to be in focus at the same time. And because multiple heights of that material are in focus at the same time, it gives the impression of a three-dimensional image. So something like this is, you know, vaguely three-dimensional because there's lots of different heights. So this part up here is very tall, whereas this is the, the base of the material. And so there's, you know, uh, hundreds of, nan uh, probably tens or hundreds of microns between the top and the bottom. And a, a lot of this image is in focus. So that's what gives it this large depth of field. So SEM is known for that depth of field and the relatively high magnification. Um, there's lots of other uh, interesting and um, useful things about SEM. Uh, you can do compositional analysis with additional tools or equipment um, and there's lots of exciting and new developments all the time but this is not an SEM course so I'll kind of uh, end it there. But I do want to also talk about the transmission electron microscopy that I mentioned because this is where we get the highest magnifications. So SEM can't quite reach the same magnifications as TEM or transmission electron micro microscopy. So here um, these are um, 
uh, images that I've collected in my own uh, research, and these are um, uh, nanoparticles um, that have a very specific shape. So there's kind of rectangular cubes and so forth. Um, and you can see that the scale bar here is 100 nanometers, right? That was our kind of overall um, limit of the optical wavelength. And so here we're much smaller than that. And so we're able to, to visualize things, uh, you know, that are one nanometer or so. Um, here's an even larger image. And you can see that these particles are 10 nanometers, right? So that's something that we wouldn't have been able to see with SEM for the most part. So TEM gives us the... Um, the biggest difference, uh, much higher magnifications. And we can get the best resolution by correcting uh, the aberration, which is a defect in imaging. And so these aberration corrected microscopes uh, increase the resolution such that we're actually able to look at single atoms or columns of atoms. And so here you kind of see this, uh, you kind of see these dots and then a black spot in the middle. And if you remember um, that um, we have a, hexa a hexagonal shape, right? This is a hexagonal plane of carbon atoms. Um, so a single sheet, oops, sorry, a single sheet uh, of this um, a single sheet of this material is known as graphene. Um, and if it's a multi-layered uh, sheets, then it's known as graphite. Uh, and so you've probably heard of graphite. That's a form of carbon um, that's a, a lubricant because of the plane structure. And each one of those uh, blobs, those white areas, is referring to a specific atom in the sheet um, in, in this case. So we're able to more or less see an atom uh, in terms of, of, of these uh, this microscope. The other thing that's interesting about this is that we have a similar material here, but you can see something else is going on. So there's regions like this that are very pristine and, and um, the structure looks ideal and the hexagonal um, structure. However, there's regions over here that are lighter. So the contrast there is actually telling us it's a different material. So this is actually silicon. When you see this light material, it's actually silicon replacing the carbon in the structure. And you also see defects in the structure, like these voids where we're missing a bunch of atoms. And so that's, again, our ability to look at these defects. So just a kind of side note if you're interested in this. Uh, so these aberration corrected TEMs, these are what kind of give us that atomic resolution. Or, you know, these are the top of the line TEMs. Um, they cost millions of dollars. Uh, and if you ever get a chance to, to, to be in the same room with them, the first thing you'll notice is how big they are. They're very tall. And that's because we generate um, electrons up here at the top, and then they actually have to go through this column and they're accelerated through this column and focused uh, towards the sample way at the bottom. Um, and then um, there's also the additional height comes from the correction that has to be done uh, to the beam. So there's lots of, um, so these are quite large uh, in order to uh, account for the aberration correction. So it's correcting an image defect. So you might have heard aberration used when you're talking about lenses and so forth. It's the same thing, but we're talking about electrons in this case. And the other things about these, these are actually highly sensitive instruments. Um, lots of times these are in isolated rooms. So you would load your sample, say, in the morning, and then those fluctuations from you being in the room and changes in temperature and pressure from opening doors, um, you would actually have to close back up the room and wait for those minor fluctuations. And basically this is the, these are typically isolated and, and sometimes run remotely so that we can get the least amount of vibrations and so forth from temperature and pressure. Uh, so they're very sensitive, very expensive instruments.